As we all know, the word holiness is there in the Bible, and it's a frequent word. Much is said about holiness in some religious circles. But what is holiness, brethren? What is the holiness? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about holiness. It is important to God, and it should be important to us as well, because without holiness, as it says in Hebrews 12, 14, we will never see God. Hebrews 12, 14, it gives us this following admonition. Pursue peace with all people. And holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So that is why this question is so all important. What is that holiness? Because without the holiness, we will not really inherit the, inter- the eternal life. And before we can even understand the Bible teaching on the subject, we must understand what the word means. Now, of course, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, and therefore we do have a Greek word and a Hebrew word. The word holiness is a noun, A noun which means state or character of being holy. Now, holy is also an adjective, which rather means belonging to, derived from, or associated with a divine power. But there is also another meaning that uh, I think we are very familiar with, and it's called set apart to the service of God. Or it used to be, say, sometimes set apart for the holy purpose. Uh, When we were at the college, I remember it was very often uh, repeated to us that being holy means being set apart for a holy purpose. Or we can say set apart again to the service of God. So in other words, that which is holy belongs to God, or conversely, whatever belongs to God is holy. Because it is sanctified. Well, why is it sanctified? Because sanctified means set apart for a holy use or purpose. So God can make an article or person holy when he claims it or becomes its owner. An individual can devote or give an object to God as well. So the ownership that passes to God, and since he is now the owner, it becomes holy. Now, why does God make an object or a person holy? Well, you see, he makes it holy so that he may use that object or that person to achieve his divine purpose, fulfill a specific function, or accomplish some task. You will all remember how the prophets of old were set apart by God, indeed, for fulfilling a, a, important tasks. You do remember, for example, the book of Ezekiel. We're going now through the book of Ezekiel. Well, Ezekiel was set apart, he was holy, because he was there to accomplish the task of you know, enduring all kinds of things and illustrating to the house of Israel at that time, the house of Israel that was in captivity, by the way, to his... Uh, comrades in captivity, illustrating to them what the prophecies of God will be fulfilled upon his people Israel. So, that's why God sets apart some people to be holy, so that he can use that person or an object to achieve his divine purpose or, you know, accomplish certain tasks or agendas, as we would say in our modern language. So, whatever is holy is not only set apart by God or for God, but God will, whatever is holy, he will not use it if it does not meet the standards he sets. Because, you know, God selects, so to speak, the tools that can fulfill his purpose. And if they do not, well, he will select another tool instead. And God expects the very best for his use. This should be expected as he is the great God of all the universe. Now, the sacrifices commanded under the Levitical priesthood were to be perfect and without blemish. We remember that from the Pentateuch. Now, only the highest, as you remember the quality, only the highest quality, only the highest quality materials were to be used in the tabernacle and in the temple. (coughs) So anything dedicated or devoted to God was to be the best. When anyone gave inferior gifts to God, it was not acceptable. Remember Malachi chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Malachi chapter 1. It is, you know, about the part of the house of Judah that returned from the Babylonian captivity. And, you know, their problem was that they were giving things that were not perfect as offerings to God. Malachi 1, verse 13. God tells them, you also say, oh, what a weariness, what a weariness, and you sneer at it says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. 
Thus you bring an offering. <laughs> Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a male and takes a while but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of the hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Well, brethren, all these physical things, you know, sacrifices and uh, uh, male, uh, you know, male goats and uh, male ox and so on, all these physical things, they were typical of spiritual perfection that would come later. That spiritual perfection should be evident when we realize that one of the synonyms for holiness is indeed godliness. And then we have Hebrew and Greek words that do explain that to us because those previous quotes from various dictionaries that I used, they relate to English words. So we also need to understand a little about the Hebrew and Greek words from which these were translated because, as you know, the original language does indeed always offer us sometimes and very often a deeper insight into what we are to understand. So, in the Hebrew, the word for holiness is Kodesh. You might remember that when we speak about the Holy Spirit, you might remember sometimes I use that lovely expression, Ruach HaKodesh. That's what it means, the Holy Spirit in Hebrew. And uh, it is taken from a similar but a different primitive root word, Kadash. So those two Hebrew words, Kodesh and Kadash, they're translated into English and other languages as holiness, holy, and sanctify or sanctified. Now, these English and Hebrew words, they mean essentially the same thing, except some are used differently in the sentence, and therefore they are translated differently because of that. Now, that's the Old Testament. Now, in the New Testament, Greek, we discover a similar situation. Because the Greek word is hagios, with its variations. Hagios, you do remember very well, hagiography. There is a word in English, hagiography. Well, exactly, it comes from the word hagios in Hebrew. So, we have kodesh and hagios. And we have a question, how can people become holy? Well, in Leviticus 11, chapter 44, the God of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, said to the whole nation of Israel, You shall be holy, for I am holy. So, you know, this was, brethren, said to the entire Israel. So, not only God did expect, the, of, you know, of those people to be holy, uh, but He expected, you know, and He also expects today, of all of us Christ followers too. Because the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 exactly repeats what we have just read in Leviticus 11. He quotes the Leviticus 11 and says, Be holy as I am holy. Now, of course, that implies more than just being set apart. Because in the context of both chapters in Leviticus and Peter, it includes living in a special way that is different from the rest of the world. That's why Israel was set apart to be holy nation, brethren, to be an example, a role model for the rest of the world. That's why we have been set apart as well. Because, you know, it's a special way of living that is different from the rest of the world. So to live that special way, we need to be and can be partakers of some of God's holiness. As we can read in Hebrew 12, verse 10, in Hebrew 12, verse 10, it says, the Apostle Paul writes in this message, and it says, For they indeed, for a few days, chastened us as seemed best to them, speaking of our biological parents, but he, for our profit, that we may be partaker, partakers of his holiness. That's exactly what God wants to accomplish. He wants us to be extension of his holiness. He wants us to be indeed set apart in all those ways that we are to be set apart. So that's exactly what you know God expects of his followers, of his servants, just like he expected the entire nation 
in the ancient Israel to be holy, he expects us to be holy. So our parents, as it says in Hebrew 12, they chastened us for a you know, few days, as it seemed best to them, but you know, for our profit, God, God does do it for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness, because, well, because without his holiness we will not see the Lord. Now also, we have to understand that uh, as Christ followers, we are indeed to, you know, we are, we are to be like him. And to be like him, it's a process, so it takes, you know, from day to day. So we should be more like him day to day, and then in the first resurrection, we will be literally like him. That's what we read in First John chapter 3 and verse 2. And, you know, interesting enough, we'll be like him. And people say, well, he is God. And what do you think, that you'll be like God's? Well, yes, we'll be exactly like him. If he is God, we will be God's. What else can we be? You know, each animal kind breeds its own kind. Uh, you know, every human, they breed their own human, human kind. What can be the one or the ones that God is going to breed? Well, who can be born of God? Those who will be in the first resurrection. What will they be? Well, they cannot be animals. They cannot be humans because the flesh and blood cannot inherit the eternal life. So all that they can only be is to be gods. What else? And in First John chapter 3, that will be verse uh, 2, we exactly read that we'll be like him when he appears. First John 3, 2, it says, John says to us, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, of course, begotten sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And this is exactly sure. Because, you know, we will be to be more like God day by day. Day from day to day. And then in the first resurrection we will be completely like God. Because God has selected his servants. He called his servants to come out of this world. To be different. And to be separated from the rest of the world. In John 17... Uh, we read that every time, every year at the Passover service, John 17, verse 14 through 16, Jesus said about his disciples, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So indeed, brethren, that's exactly why we have been called, to be different, to be separate from the rest of the world, indeed. And this was the last prayer of Jesus Christ, because he certainly, I'm sure, realized how difficult it would be, at times, or at all time, to be different from the world and keep away from the world. Uh, and especially in these seasons like now, we can feel feel that a bit more. Because... Your, Christ, your your uh, Easter season has long been passed, but here in Serbia, the Easter Sunday is exactly tomorrow. And of course, you know, prior to Easter Sunday, people just rush to make all kinds of purchases and things to dye eggs and uh, other things and gifts and, and all sorts of things. And you can feel this pressure in the air. Now, interestingly enough, also the Valpurgis night last night, happened to be Good Friday in the Serbian tradition. So, here now on the Sabbath, we are basically sandwiched between paganism and pagan holidays. Because many of our kinsmen, in the morning, this morning, after the Valpurgis night, they even spent, they either spend the night somewhere in the woods, and will be making some fire and roasting beefs and other things, or they would just go rush in the morning to the, you know, to the woods and to the countryside to have the first May morning celebration. Well, I know today is the International Day of uh, Workers' Day indeed, but you see the uh, remains of pagan practices are still present in, uh, in this nation, for example. So we are now sandwiched now right between, in several hours at midnight, the church bells will be singing and the uh, people here will be celebrating what they believe to be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
but in fact they're celebrating the resurrection of the sun god, you know. So in situations like this, when you have this uh, series of pagan events, you do realize how much we are to be different from the world. You know, I prayed to God last night. I was uh, It was a, finally for the first time. It was a lovely night, so it was not cold. I could stay outside on my balcony. And it was Valpurgis night, and I... I prayed to God, I said, you know, uh, just keep us away from all this paganism and thank you for opening our minds so that we can be different from this world. And one of the reasons why we couldn't continue today with the book of Ezekiel is that brethren, I had to make a special message in Serbian for today. I had to make a very special message because we are, like I told you, this Sabbath uh, well, yesterday was Good Friday, and then came the Valpurgis night between Friday and Saturday. And then now on this Sabbath, it's Good Sa- Good Saturday, as they call it in Serbian, or Great Saturday. And tomorrow will be there, you know, Easter, Orthodox, Easter, pagan, pagan, uh, you know, celebration. And you do remember, as we read the book of Ezekiel, you remember the greatest paganism, the most abominable, idolatrous, uh, custom of all was Easter Sunday worship. So, you know, being sandwiched between these pagan holidays, I thought it was the good opportunity to make a strong message, as I have never made it before in Serbian, to warn this nation about its pagan practices. Their first May, you know, uh, morning fires and and, and and celebration, the false tradition of the Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Also, I felt it was a need, I had a need to remind them of how pagan deeply and abominable was the Easter Sunday. And I had to remind them also of who was the one in the 4th century who outlawed God's Passover and instituted instead Pagan Sunday. So I, this afternoon, I think I've delivered a very strong and powerful message about those pagan things as never before. You know, in the past, I would kind of try to be considerate and not to make strong statements and words because I understand that people are deceived by Satan. But now, brethren, somehow, I felt the time has come that put my life online, so to speak, and tell them very clearly that all those practices are coming from Satan (coughs) and that they're satanic. So, again, this afternoon I delivered, and of course to prepare that message took me a long time, and uh, took me part of the last night, Friday night as well, so that's why I couldn't dedicate myself to uh, continue with Ezekiel with you today in English, because this was a rare opportunity where you have all of these series of pagan holidays in the nation, and this was a rare opportunity that I could use this occasion indeed to send, again, as far as I know, the strongest ever warning message about the nature of all those holidays that they are keeping, that my kinsmen are keeping all around us. So that's why we realize how it is important to be different, because we are not of the world. You know, the Christians, and the Christians in general, they must they must live in this world, which is the present evil, evil world, but you know, his life or her life, must be different from the rest of the world. You know, a Christian must come out from any of this world's ways that are sinful or evil. He should come out from the religions and spiritual Babylon that engulfs this whole world. Revelation 18.4, I quoted that today in Serbian. Revelation 18.4 in my closing comments. Because, brethren, we do have some people who are not part of the Church of God, but they are listening carefully to what I'm saying. And for their own benefits as well, I felt there was a need to dedicate much of my time and uh, release a very solid and strong warning about these festival seasons. You know, because all these festival seasons have this, they have all this fake joy and this fake exhilaration, you know, and I had to tell people, where does that come from? By the way, the Serbian Orthodox Church the other day said, Oh, they lamented and said, let's not make Easter only a custom. Let's uh, imbue it with some joy and exhilaration. I'm thinking, no, that will not happen. (laughs) 
You cannot, you cannot have a true joy and true exhilaration based on lie. You know, based on paganism, because all that they did with with, with Easter, you know, they just uh, put some makeup on paganism and said this is a Christian holiday. Well, there is nothing Christian. It's completely unChristian holiday. In Revelation eighteen four. We are to be different. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, of the sins of that religion, brethren, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Basically, sins of the nominal Christianity, because, of course, in chapter 17, we read about the nominal, leading nominal Christian church, which poses itself as a Christian, but it's actually a satanic institution. So we are to come out from the religions and spiritual Babylon that engulfs the whole world. Uh, well, when you look at these poor people not knowing all these things that we know, it seems to me that they're being completely chained by this uh, by this modern Babylon. So Christians should be different because in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20, the Apostle Paul said that we are bought with a price. We are bought with a price. And we know what that price is. In fact, you know, last month we did keep the Passover service and we were reminded of the price, brethren. That price Christ sacrifice, it makes it possible for us to be forgiven of our past sins and to receive the Holy Spirit. But of course, like in Romans 8 and verse 9, it says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He doesn't belong to Christ, doesn't belong to God, you see. And when we receive the Holy Spirit, then we become a holy temple. Because we know that the Holy Spirit in dwelling in us makes us a holy temple. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, the Apostle Paul asks, Do you know, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Now, how do we receive the Holy Spirit? Well, of course, we receive it by repenting. As you know, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, all those desperate men lamented to the apostles and said, oh, they realized they had killed Jesus Christ, who was the God of the Old Testament. They killed their own Messiah. What should we do, men and brethren? And then the apostle Peter tells them, repent. So that every one of you, you know, and be baptized, so that every one of you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as a result. So first we repent and then... After that, we must be baptized. And after that, the Holy Spirit is promised. Of course, the question is, what does it mean to repent? Well, it means to be sorry for past sins, ask forgiveness, turn around, the determine to quit sinning. And when we quit sinning, we begin to obey God's spiritual law, because sin, as we know from 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. And God will only give His Holy Spirit to those who obey Him. That's what the Apostle said in Acts chapter 5, verse 32, when they were taken before the Sanhedrin. And they were, you know, investigated for why they preached the name of Jesus Christ. Well, they said that there was no name under heaven by which we might be saved. And uh, they also said that God will not give His Holy Spirit to those who do not obey Him. Now, of course, with the world around us, we hear that only love is needed. You know, love is in the air. Love is all you need is love. Dun, 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 dun. You all know, remember that in all generations, the same story: love and love and love. So, love is you know, all we need is love. Love is in the air, and so on. It's all about love, not only in the religious spheres, but also in the secular spheres. Now, is love only needed, brethren? Well, some believe that all they need is love, and that is true. If you understand what that kind of love is, what it means, and how it is expressed. You know, it is the true love, divine love, is much more than affection or fondness of others. You know, love is even more than worship of God. Because Christ says in uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 6 and 7, you know, he says that many worshipped him in vain. Why? They loved him in vain? Well, because they were teaching and following the commandments of men rather than commandments of God. And indeed, in First John chapter 5, verse 3, the Apostle John also emphasized that point. And he says, 
For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And all of you very well know how much the nominal Christianity hates all of God's commandments. Now that right kind of love includes obedience to God and his commandments. And when God calls us, we are 100% carnal, unconverted and imperfect. That moment when he calls us. But however, God wants perfection as we know. Because we do have this high bar standard in Matthew 5, verse 48, which says, Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That is exactly the high bar that we all need to attain to. So, God wants perfection. In Genesis 17, 1, when he was addressing Abraham, he said to Abraham, Walk before me and be thou perfect or blameless not really perfect because nobody is perfect so god wants a glorious church he wants a church without spot or wrinkle like in ephesians chapter 5 i'm sure you remember that speaking about the bride of jesus christ ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 27 we read that god wants us as a church to be that he might present us uh, to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but it should be a it should be holy and without blemish holy and without blemish holy and you know without any wrinkles or imperfections so god wants change from imperfection to perfection he wants us to begin to change to live holy lives and to live a life of holiness which means, in turn, that, you know, it is a new way of living, which is more and more the kind of life that he lived. Because we need to walk holiness, not just talk holiness, you know. Remember in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, verse 9, there is a piece which says, Hallowed be your name, Jesus said. Well, what does it mean to hallow your na- be your name? Well, to hallow, brethren, is to make holy. Because the word halal is actually from the same root, Greek word, hagios, translated holy elsewhere. So we should halal God's name in all our thoughts, words and deeds. So living a life of holiness and coming out of this world and being separate from the world involves every aspect of our lives. The Apostle Paul addresses us in Second Corinthians chapter 6. And he tells us not to be unequally yoked with, or together with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I'll be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, now again the quote, Come out from her among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Well, we have, you know, the holy and profane, brethren. And today, there are many devout people who do not see any difference or make any distinction between what is profane and what is holy. One example that some have either not seen or rejected is found in First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5. I'm sure you do know what it is talking about, about the uh, various uh, difficulties in the last days. First Timothy 4, 5. It says... For it is, uh, sorry, is it First Timothy or is it Second Timothy? First Timothy four five. It should be. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So that's exactly you know why we are to see the make distinction between profane and uh, between sanctified. Now, in this place, we see that 
uh, I've just quoted First Timothy 4, 5, we see that there are foods that God created to, you know, to be received with thanksgiving because they're sanctified by God's word for that purpose. The word sanctified comes from the same Greek word hagios, which, as we have seen, is elsewhere translated holy and sacred. Now, what food has God sanctified or set apart for human consumption? Well, the answer is found in Leviticus chapter 11, where God told Moses the difference between holy, the holy and profane, the, the acceptable and the abominable. It is in that context that God says in verse 45, You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. So this, you see, distinction that was made personally by God has never been changed contrary to what some people try to read into the New Testament scriptures. Making such a distinction and living by it is another of the many ways that God's true servants are different from most of the rest of the world. So instead of being immersed in the lawlessness and sinful ways of this world, we should put our thoughts on better things. Just like Philippians 4.8, in which Paul tells us that finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any other virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You know, from the way some people live, this verse would read, well, whatever things are false, whatever things are ignoble, whatever things are unjust, whatever things are impure, whatever things are unlovely, whatever things are of good, bad report, if there is any evil and if there is anything despicable, meditate on these things. Well, that seems to be the spirit of our age. Now, this scripture indeed, brethren, should clarify the fact that we should be, we should avoid filling our minds with entertainment that is sinful, lustful, illicit sexually, that is filled with murder, hatred, or evil. Well, but you know, some may say, well, it's only a song, it's only, you know, um, it's only make-believe, it's only a movie. Well, they're better deceived on the contrary. Paul said that we should be casting down, this is Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says that we should be casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity for obedience to the, obe to captivity to the obedience of Christ. Well, you know, we are, in other words, to live a life of holiness. And then, it continues, 2 Corinthians, it's uh, chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, Lord, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. So we are, you see, to cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and spirit, and perf perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Well, we will co continue to be holy as long as we live a life of holiness. You see, that is the way of obedience and conformity with God's way and spiritual laws. Now, here are some examples of what was holy in the past, but it is no longer today, because of failure to measure up to God's standards. Ancient Israel was a chosen and holy nation, but they rebelled against God and his laws, turning to idolatry and sin. So God cut them off, and they are now not now his chosen and holy people. They are still his chosen people, but not right now for the uh, when it comes to the eternal life and inheriting the eternal life. Instead, God has called out his church, which is a holy nation. The Levites were holy, but they failed in what God assigned them to do. So, because of that, they are no longer holy and have been replaced by the priesthood of Melchizedek. You see, that the temple, the temple was holy. But, but Israel and Judah 
polluted it by their sins and wickedness, so it was then consequently destroyed. It is no longer in existence. It has now, and uh, you know, it has now been replaced by a new church and holy spiritual temple, which is the church. And there are other biblical examples of what what was holy in the past, and it is still holy today. The little was and is still holy to God. The tithe, because a little bit of money is still, you know, holy to God. You can read about it in Malachi chapter 3 verses 18 through 12 and in Leviticus 27 verse 32. Well, why the tithe is still holy? Because brethren, it belongs to God and he has never made it unholy. Also, the weekly Sabbath was and is still holy to God. We see that from the very foundation of the of the of the earth. In Leviticus twenty three verse two, we have that you know the weekly Sabbath is, is holy. In Mark chapter two verse twenty eight, in Acts seventeen verse two, so the Sabbath was and is holy to God. We will remember and keep it holy, or forget what Almighty God commanded forever. So it is holy time and we should keep it that way. There are many other scriptures to relate to true holiness. Now, to live a life of holiness, one must continue to learn from these scriptures about the nature and the way of our great God. As we learn, we must change to those better ways of God, you know. From all these scriptures, it should be plain that holiness is not a sentiment or a feeling in your heart. It is not following the religious tradition of men. To walk in holiness, a person must first be called of God or set apart from the world. He must then repent, be baptized, and receive the Holy Spirit. Following you know, this, he must be obedient to the uh, commandments and ways of the Almighty God. And then he begins to fulfill the holy use and purpose for that calling. Now, we also have a question, what is a saint? Well, the Bible indeed mentions saints many times, but there are many misconceptions about what saints are. You see, the Bible nowhere says or even implies that it is a good religious person who died many years ago. You know, it is not a person who has a hollow around his head or God's word around, you know, would, would, would have it. So indeed, a saint is a person who is holy to God. It is a person who is sanctified or set apart by God and lives a life of holiness. In the New Testament, the Greek word for saint is the same word that is also translated holy. In the Old Testament, it is sometimes uh, the same word or a derivative of the same word. So God's servants are called to be saints, says in Romans chapter 1 verse 7. Now notice, brethren, that the words to be uh, God's are, uh, so to be saints, they are in italics. This means that the words were added by the translators. You see, they were already saints. Saints are sanctified, First Corinthians one, verse two, but not yet perfect, as they as they still need to be protected because of various problems, and also perfected. Ephesians chapter four, verse twelve. We need to be perfected. Ephesians four. Ephesians 4, verse 12, says, uh, the Bible, let the Bible be open, in 2 and Ephesians 4, did I say Ephesians, right? Oh, I'm in John, why am I in John? Ephesians 4, and in verse 12, that's right. Okay, Ephesians 4, 12, we are to be perfected yet. That's why we read in this verse, for the perfecting of the saints, God gave some apostles and some, you know, teachers, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So, we indeed are already, you know, saints are sanctified, we're all the saints in a sense, but we are not yet perfected and we still need to be perfected. Now, saints are also described by the Apostle John in Revelation 4.12. He 
Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, or as it says, or have, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ in some other translations. So reward of the saints uh, have been set apart for God's holy use and for God's purpose, indeed. Because we had better be fulfilling that purpose, brethren. If we do, we will meet Christ in the air at his second coming, and then return with him to the earth, as it says in Zechariah. At which time, the saints will possess God's kingdom under Christ, so that, you know, they may rule all of the nations of this earth. And uh, that's exactly what we are promised in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. It says that they'll, they'll rule upon the, upon the earth. That's us. The same is promised in Daniel 7 verses 18 and 22, that the people of God will inherit indeed the whole earth and will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, brethren, that's the glorious future that awaits the saints who truly, you know, walk in holiness. The saints who are truly sanctified and made holy. It should, you know, now be evident, therefore, that there is a lot more to the holiness that most people realize, including those who may talk a lot about it. Well, don't have a counterfeit holiness. Holiness under quotation mark. You know, have the real thing. You know, give your life to God and as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to Him, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That is exactly what we are commanded in Romans 12, 2. And we will continue, or we will uh, finish with that scripture and continue at some other time. Uh, we are looking for, we are now looking for uh, Romans 12. Romans. Romans 12, here it is. And uh, we are looking for the first two verses of the Romans 12, the famous two verses. The Apostle Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 